My final predictive mock is here. It's not what I would do. It's what I think will happen based on things I've heard, based on things people are saying. And of course, around draft season, we know there are a lot of smoke screens, but sometimes where there's smoke, there's fire. So I'm going to be hopefully following as many of those as I can and correctly predicting which team these top 32 prospects will end up going to. And of course, it isn't what I would do, but it's what I think will happen. I've decided not to do trades as I'm just trying to get the correct team or the player. And I think it's just a little bit too difficult to predict the trade. And especially in a year like this, where it's not a super top heavy draft, the talent is not what we're exactly used to, but there are good players. It's a really depth heavy draft, which kind of leads me to believe that teams might be more comfortable staying put more than they have in recent years. Also, future Bengal probably watching this. <laughs> Hope you did okay. But uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I'm super excited. I am streaming the draft today as you watch this later tonight. It's going to be on this YouTube channel, probably live at around 7.30 Eastern time. Should be a blast. I'm going to be live with Drew, not the expert, Wheels, and late edition is Moonlight Swami. So very excited for this draft coverage per usual. I can't stream the actual draft. So if you come in and you expect that, you're going to be disappointed. But it will be a watch party, live reactions, live videos on this channel, and many videos to come after the draft, even on draft night. A lot of late uploads incoming, so be prepared for that. And let's kick things off. I believe Trayvon Walker will be the number one overall pick. All signs seem to point that way, and it really comes down to Trent Baalke making the call. Loves his long-armed pass rushers, and for me, Trayvon Walker definitely checks the boxes of what Balky and the Jags will be looking for, and that ends up being the pick over Aiden Hutchinson, who will be my number two overall pick. I think Malik Willis is in play. I think Kayvon Thibodeau is in play, but ultimately, I'm going to play it safe and go with Aiden Hutchinson, which I think has the highest likelihood of happening. At number three, I really thought this was going to be Sauce Gardner for a while, but it seems like things are pointing more towards Ikemakwanu, Ikeakwanu from NC State. I think that Derek Stingley Jr. is also a possibility. He just got super high upside, and Lovey Smith really covets a corner. And will you be able to get a really good one at 13? I'm not sure about that. Could see them trade back up. Could see them trade down from this three spot. Could see them stay put and take a corner as well. But for now, I am going to go with Aquanu with the idea of playing him probably at left guard and moving Titus Howard back to a more natural offensive tackle position on that right side opposite Laramie Tunsil. At number four, this is where Sauce Gardner goes for me. I don't really think he's going to make it to the Giants at five, even though I would like that. I think he goes at three or four, maybe gets to the Giants, although I, I find it unlikely at this point. I think most likely goes at three or four, leaving the Giants at five to take Evan Neal. I know they've been linked to Charles Cross. I'm not sure what they're trying to do with that. Maybe they do like Charles Cross, but I think in the end, you have Andrew Thomas that plays left tackle. And are you going to take the guy that's also like a prototypical natural left tackle? I don't think you're going to do that. We know Evan Neal can play right tackle. Andrew Thomas is coming along on that left side. I don't know why you would try and screw any of that up and just take a gamble on cross on that right side. We know Neil can do it and do it at a high level. That's the pick here for me. And he really should be in play for that number one spot in any of these top four spots before the Giants as well. I think Evan Neal, he just really checks all the boxes that you're looking for from an offensive tackle in terms of size, athleticism, and then clean tape. Pretty good on tape. So it's amazing the Giants can get him here at five if they do. I think that will end up being the pick. And I really bounced back and forth on, uh, forth on this. I thought quarterback for a while, but eventually I'm going to settle on Charles Cross. Might be just the best player available, especially for the Panthers, who desperately need left tackle. Cross is the guy for me here. Kenny Pickett, I think, is in play. I really do. But ultimately, I will settle on Cross. To leave the Giants at 7, who are in quite an advantageous position. I think this could be Kayvon Thibodeau or Jermaine Johnson. I think it could be Derek Singley Jr. or Garrett Wilson. I think it will end up being one of those four. And for me, I think it has to be Kayvon Thibodeau at this seven spot. I know there's so much talk about him going anywhere from like one to 10, even beyond that in some cases. 
But I think if Kayvon Thibodeau is on the board, you just have to go with best player available. And for me, it absolutely would be Kayvon Thibodeau at this spot. And I think that's what general manager Joe Shane will end up doing in the end. I think he is BPA focused. And I don't think that's Garrett Wilson. As much as I like him as a player, I don't think Garrett Wilson's the best player available. I don't think Jermaine Johnson is better than Kayvon Thibodeau at this moment. I do really like him as a player though, so it wouldn't surprise me. And then with Stingley, I just kind of don't know what you're getting with him. Where if he's healthy and at full effort, Derek Stingley is a monster. And it would not shock me if he's one of the best players in this class when all is said and done. He is one of the few like blue chip prospects at his best. But the reason he doesn't kind of have that blue chip mark on him is the injuries and the effort concerns. So I don't have Stingley at seven. I think it is in play though. Same with Jermaine Johnson. At eight, this is a trade down spot. The Panthers are also a trade down spot as well. I think a team could be moving up for a receiver here, but the question is, who would that be? Philadelphia at 15 maybe? But I also think the Falcons could stay put and take a receiver. And in the end, I'm trying to match the player to the team, and that's gonna be Garrett Wilson for me. Whether it's here at eight or a little bit later, I'm not sure. You might see a swap with like Atlanta and the Jets or Washington or even Minnesota. Philadelphia down the board. I think those are all options. Maybe even it's Houston moving up for a corner as well. I think that could happen. I really think Derek Stingley could end up on the Texans. And I think it could be the Seahawks moving down from nine. It could be the Falcons moving down from eight. A lot is in play here. But at number nine, I'm going to go with Jermaine Johnson out of Florida State. Jermaine Johnson is really, really talented. The Seahawks have a big need for edge rush. I wouldn't be shocked if this is the first trade down of the draft with the Texans moving up for Derek Stingley. I really wouldn't. In fact, I'm extremely tempted to make that happen, but I am going to stick to the draft order here and go Jermaine Johnson. If it ends up that the Texans get Stingley, I didn't call it, I guess, even though that's kind of what I'm doing, but I'm not doing it in the final mock, but I, I do want to recognize that possibility. The Jets at number 10. You got receivers on the board, and I think that Drake London makes a lot of sense for them. As does Jamison Williams. I still think injury might drop him a little bit more than the top 10, despite how tremendously talented he is. Great player, but in the end, I am going with Drake London at this 10 spot, right in front of the commanders who may have taken him at 11. And I will settle on Kyle Hamilton, who would be a much improved player in that Washington secondary. They could really use a safety, even if I don't really believe he can play over the top. Still a good safety prospect, no question about it. Vikings at 12. This has to be Derek Stingley at this point. It really does. Now, again, I think there's a good chance he ends up on the Texans, but I also think there's a pretty good chance he ends up on LSU. And having a mentor like Patrick Peterson, wearing the purple and gold still, I think it's a really, really good fit, especially for a team that really horribly needs a corner. So this is just kind of a match made in heaven for me, which leaves the Texans in a bit of a tough spot, but I think it might end up being just a freak athlete monster on the interior of the defensive line in Jordan Davis. This is just the value here. Jordan Davis over under is 13 and a half. I think he goes probably to the Texans or the Ravens. But I will settle on Houston here as we move to the Ravens at 14. And it's this is not a pick I love. But it's a pick that I think will end up happening based on what I've heard. And that is Trevor Penning to the Ravens. I think it's going to be an unpopular selection. But I think Penning would certainly work in the Ravens system as a guard right away. You have Morgan Moses at right tackle. And I think the goal is to eventually move Trevor Penning to right tackle and maybe even end up starting with how injury prone Ronnie Stanley has been at times. But this is just a player that is linked to the team. It doesn't feel right, but this is what people are saying. So I have to follow that to some degree. The Ravens are heavily linked to Trevor Penning. How viable is that? How real is that? We're going to find out tonight as you see this, but this is one that I don't feel too great about. As we move to the Eagles at 15, I think this has to be Jamison Williams. I think the Eagles could end up moving up for him as well. I think it might be a situation where multiple teams might be trying to move up to that 13 spot. 
if Stingley's off the board or if a trade down happened. So I think if the Texans moved up for Stingley, I think the Eagles are going to want to move up for Jamison Williams, and it might be whoever would own that 13 spot still looking to move back and accumulate picks, and the Eagles have a lot of picks to potentially trade. But I do think Jamison Williams ends up being a Philadelphia Eagle as much as I would hate that as a Giants fan because I think he's incredibly talented. We get to the Saints here at 16, and I really do believe that this could be back-to-back receivers off the board, and it's just too easy of a connection to make with The Saints and Ohio State players, especially at a position of need. Chris Olave just makes all the sense in the world here. I think Penning would be in play if he makes it to 16. I think he'd be in play if he made it to 17 as well, and 19 for the same reason that he's in play at 16. But Trevor Penning being grabbed a little bit early with this early run of tackles, I think kind of muddies the waters for a lot of these other teams. And I do think Chris Olave will end up being the pick here at 16 for the Saints. 17 is one of the toughest spots in the draft to me based on the way this has fallen. A lot of the top receivers off the board, I'm not sure they'd be itching to take Jahan Dotson here, but he is quite good. Not really any tackles available. And I don't know if they're going to take a linebacker again. They kind of just keep taking these athletic linebackers that haven't quite panned out. And for me, I think I'm just going to end up going with best player available at a position of need, and it kind of goes along with their strengths already of being a team that can put up a lot of points. And their offensive line, in my opinion, is one of their real weak points on the team, where you only have a few positions solidified, and Rashawn Slater really being your clear best player on the offensive line. Corey Lindsley quite good as well at center, but left guard, right guard, up in the air, right tackle, up in the air. Now there's a contingency that likes Matt Filer at left guard. I don't think he's great. And I am going to end up going with Zion Johnson. I do think he has positional flexibility in terms of left guard and right guard. He took snaps at the senior bowl at center. I think he could do that if you wanted him to, depending on the team. Doesn't have to be the Chargers. Now, Is he a player going to move to tackle? I think that's unlikely. But the Chargers really do not have many interior offensive linemen on the team, period, and are very, very, very thin at guard and could use an upgrade. I think the player matches the team fit and spot here overall. So Zion Johnson is the guy for me at 17. Bringing up the Eagles for their 18th pick, or the 18th pick, their second pick. And I think that's going to end up being Trent McDuffie corner out of Washington. Another pick that I really would not like as I am extremely high on Trent McDuffie. I think he's a really, really talented player. And that's not just as a boundary corner. I think that's also at free safety. I think it's also as a nickel corner, somebody that can move around as well. I think McDuffie is fantastic. And seeing him go at 18, I would hate a lot as a Giants fan. The Saints have been a difficult team to draft for, in my opinion as they have a number of different holes you can point to and a number of different things that you think they might address. There just isn't a tackle worth taking at this spot, in my opinion, and for that reason, I don't believe the Saints will reach on one, but rather wait for one to be available with one of their later selections. There is good value down the board in Abraham Lucas at right tackle, Zach Tom to play left tackle potentially, and you could even play Nicholas Petit Frere at left tackle and I think be fairly happy with that depending on the value of the selection and for me I think you'd at least consider moving Ryan Ramchek to left tackle but I think the Saints think they're ready to win now and I am actually inclined to agree with them I do not believe they're going to be nearly as bad as everyone seems to I don't think they're going to have a top five or top 10 pick next year I think most likely worst case scenario they're going to be just outside the top 10. But what do you do to compete? Well, I think it's clear where their values have been. And to me, I keep seeing them trying to target this linebacker spot. And they just really haven't seemed to have been able to get what they're looking for in Alex Anzalone and in Zach Bond. I would think they love someone to play Sam linebacker with size and coverage ability as well and someone that can also rush the passer at times. And I think Dennis Allen would absolutely love Devin Lloyd out of Utah for those reasons at 19. I think it is a pick that makes sense. I think it's a bit of a surprising pick, but I think the value also checks out on this. So Devin Lloyd is the pick here for me at number 19. 
leaving the Steelers, someone that I think Mike Tomlin could simply not pound the table for enough. I think Malik Willis will be the pick here at number 20 if he is available. I think there's a chance the Steelers move up, but on draft night, things start to solidify. I think if the Steelers believe there's a chance he will fall to them, I think they might just stay put and take that chance with a volatile prospect, extremely volatile prospect like Malik Willis is. Very high ceiling though. Mike Tomlin's talked a lot about adding a mobile dual threat quarterback and it's something he has not been able to have with Big Ben over the past uh, decade or so. So Malik Willis, and, and I say decade or so because Ben had a little bit of mobility, not a ton, but a little bit of mobility in his younger days, not so much after the or from the past uh, 10 years or so. But Malik Willis at 20, I think, will be the selection if he makes it to that spot. Leaving the Patriots with, I think, a pretty favorable board. I really do. They have Kenyon Green if they want to go interior offensive line. I don't think they're going to do that, but I think it's a possibility, so I'm mentioning it. There's corner, Kyrie Elam. They really do need cornerback, 100%. Andrew Booth Jr. for the same reasons. They could just go Devontae Wyatt, upgrade the interior of the defensive line, get a big, another pass rushing monster on the interior, but they might believe they already have that in Christian Barmore. And I, I really love Dax Hill as a fit, but I'm gonna settle on Quay Walker out of Georgia. Not the first linebacker off the board, but he's close. And he's having a meteoric rise right now. And he's super athletic. He's got the long arms that you look for. He's got extreme athleticism that you look for. And the Patriots really covet a player like Quay Walker. The length, the raw athleticism. I think Jamie Collins is not a one-for-one -one comparison, but it's the type of player that New England likes. And I know Jamie Collins was not near a first round selection, but Quay Walker at 21, I think is in line with what the Patriots believe philosophically. And we see them hit on their first round picks and they can develop players and find a spot for these guys to make sense and play well. And yeah, Patriots really could use an upgraded corner, but I think the Patriots are also a team that bet on themselves routinely and love to take a DB in round two. For that reason, I'm going a different direction with Quay Walker here at 21. Packers at 22. It's been a boring pick of late, but I'm going to stick with it. Traylon Burks out of Arkansas. With all these receivers off the board, I'm not sure what you do if you're Green Bay. I think that you might end up taking receiver at 28, but then you worry about other teams like the Lions moving back up or the Chiefs moving back up or Dallas, Buffalo, Tennessee taking a receiver in front of you. Even Arizona could end up taking a receiver. So I think if the Packers like Traylon Burks enough more than some of these other options, I think they will end up going with receiver here at 22 as opposed to 28 or even later in the draft. So Burks is the pick here. Good fit for the team as well. So I really think this is a fine selection and a really good fit. And that leaves the Cardinals on the board to take Kair Elam. He is supposed to be maybe the fourth corner off the board. That seems to be the belief right now. And for me, that would have to go with Sauce Gardner one, Stingley two, maybe flip those. And then Trent McDuffie three, Kair Elam naturally falls in line at that four spot. Good press man corner and his best football could be ahead of him. So I'm excited about the potential of this pick coming to fruition. I think it's a really good player to team fit. And I think the value works out as well. I do really like Andrew Booth Jr. as well, but I think Elam is a better fit for the team as I'll make a somewhat boring selection here, which is Kenyon Green out of Texas A&M to the Dallas Cowboys, which makes too much sense. I mean, got a guy staying in state. He's got good tape. There's a significant need at left guard. Green has experienced playing four of the five spots in the offensive line with the exception of center. He is a good player, good athlete. And I think when you look to not only the Cowboys draft history with taking offensive linemen, but their success as an offense, it revolved around great offensive line play. And that's an offensive line that had Tyron Smith and Travis Frederick and Zach Martin as kind of the core pieces of that line with good players 
in between as well. I mean, we've seen Lyle Collins more recently. I mean, Doug Free was a decent lineman for a while at right tackle. But Kenyon Green here, I think makes sense. Good player. This is about his range to me. And he's going to a team that could really use the help. It's an impact starter right away that fits the offense. It just seems too perfect. So surely it will not happen as it gets to the Bills at 25. And I thought about this for a while. And I think I ultimately ended up going with a corner here over a running back in Brees Hall. And it's not actually going to be Andrew Booth Jr. It's going to be Kyler Gordon from Washington, who is a physical press corner with decent athleticism. I was surprised with how much I liked him when I watched him on tape. I thought McDuffie was amazing. I didn't think Kyler Gordon was going to be quite so good. Very different style of player. But Gordon, I think, will go in the first round for good reason. He's someone that probably doesn't go before 23, but I don't know if he gets past 31 with the Bengals. So I think this is about his range. The Bills have a real need at corner, and Kyler Gordon got a draft invite. I think the league views him quite highly, and I think he's going to end up going higher than you'd expect. I have him here at 25. Bringing up the Titans at 26, and... I debated on giving them a receiver for a long time. I don't want to give them a linebacker here, but I think it will ultimately end up being an offensive lineman. And I've said the best player to team fit in the entire draft is probably Tyler Smith from Tulsa to the Titans. Played left tackle at Tulsa. Might be able to play him at right tackle if you're the Titans or guard right away. The Titans have needs on the offensive line. And yes, they're a sneaky quarterback or receiver team here. But I think it will end up being an offensive lineman. And I think Tyler Smith is just too perfect of a fit for me to turn that down. Probably the furthest that Devontae Wyatt has fallen for me in a mock draft. And it's going to stop here. Yeah, there are some concerns. going to be 24, might even be 24 years old. A little bit older for a draft prospect, no doubt. There are some off-field concerns with him that have come to light as well. But I think ultimately he's too good of a player to get past the Bucks here at 27. Fills an immediate need on the defensive line as well. Play in that Indomitian Sue role. And I think he compares favorably at you know, the point where Sue is in his career to where Devontae Wyatt could be. And he's on the rise. Um, so I like Wyatt for the next few years. And especially I think you can afford to take an older player that fills an immediate need and plays an immediate impact as well because you are ready to play right now with Tom Brady maybe coming back for one last ride one final year I think you go with Devontae Wyatt just because he's too good to pass on at this spot and he's someone that can come in and make an impact right away Packers at 28 if you've seen my videos over the course of this past year you know who I'm taking here already and it's going to be Logan Hall from Houston I think he's going to be someone that sneaks into the first round based on upside. I think Packers fans are going to hate it. And I think it's going to end up happening for that reason. But Logan Hall, there's a lot to like in terms of size and could even get bigger as well. Really good athlete. He's good when you can get him on a runway and bull rush. And I think with the talent that Green Bay has on their defensive front, you're going to create one-on-ones with Kenny Clark as that big nose tackle, with Rashawn Gary off the edge, with Preston Smith, who had a pretty decent year last year. I think Hall fits in really, really well. And I, he, he fits their multiple front. I say multiple. I, he fits their front of like a guys that can move around. And Rashawn Gary is not really a true defensive end or outside linebacker. Same thing with Darius Smith, who's no longer there. Of course, he's in Minnesota now. But I think Logan Hall fits and fills that role to where he can play defensive end. He can move across the line. Now, I don't know if he's going to go as far out as the wide nine, but I think he's probably your every down five tech that can move inside and be a three sometimes. I like Logan Hall. I think he's a, a player that the NFL will like as well because of some of those reasons I illustrated, versatility and athleticism and size. That's an NFL type player. And this is just a Packers pick at 28. For the Chiefs, hopefully I don't screw up the order on this, but I'm going George and George. Not for that reason, but I think Karloftis is just good value here at 29. I think Pickens is a player you can afford to take a chance on. Pickens might be one of the best receivers in this entire class based purely on tape. He's really, really talented. But with the injury, with major off-field concerns, especially 
uh, maturity. Pickens is a bit of a problem child, and I think that teams will not have him on his on their draft board. Some teams absolutely will not have him, but the Chiefs are a team that can afford to take a chance. And you've upgraded receiver in the offseason. Well, you've lost Tyreek Hill, but you brought in Juju Smith-Schuster. You brought in Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Overall, did you downgrade? Well, you lost one of the best in the league in Tyreek Hill. But you brought in some talent. You're not forced to take a receiver, even double up. But I think this is the chance for the Chiefs where they can just really take a shot at a guy with super high upside if you can figure it out. Now, Tyreek Hill, off the field problems, ended up on the Chiefs, ended up being really, really good. He was not close to a first round pick, not close. But Pickens is so uber talented that I think they might end up taking him here in round one. And Karloftis, you just need pass rush. Uh, he fits the scheme. He can move around the defensive line as well. And the Chiefs love to move guys around the defensive line. Chris Jones had to be an edge at times last year, but is way better inside. That's where he belongs playing. That's where he plays the majority of time. But you don't want him on the edge if you can help it. You want Karloftis. I think he fits. And I think he's going to be the pick here if he makes it to 29. And then the Bengals at 31. The easy pick here is Tyler Linderbaum. I think Linderbaum falls out of the first round. And I think there are two different ways to look at it with him. One, he is mega talented. One of the best players in the entire draft class. No question for me. I think he's really, really good. The league just doesn't value centers, who are undersized especially. So when Creed Humphrey falls as far as he did, and then he has this unreal season as one of the best centers in the league. So yeah, maybe Linderbaum does sneak in and is the pick here at 31, right? Because we saw how well Creed Humphrey worked out last year. Maybe it's not as important, but the other way to look at it is, yeah, he, like he did fall. So I'm going to end up leaving him out of my first round as crazy as that feels. And I'm going to go with cornerback Andrew Booth Jr. High upside player, great athlete, good size. The Bengals could use an upgrade at corner. And Booth ends up being the guy for me here at 31. And then we have the Lions basically bookends of this draft. Nearly number one in 32, but ends up being two in 32. And there are really good players available. You got Dax Hill, who I think is tremendous. And I would be surprised to see him fall out of the first round on talent. You have Boye Mafe with high upside. You have the quarterback still available. You have Jahan Dotson, who I think is a really good fit for this team. Lewis Seen, who is really building up a lot of steam as a first round guy. David Ajaba, who would be a first round guy, if not for injury. What do you do here if you're Detroit? Well, I think it's going to end up being a quarterback, and I'm going Kenny Pickett. I think it could be Matt Corral. The reason I think it will be a quarterback is because he is cheaper than Jared Goff. That's what it comes down to for me. He doesn't have to start right away, even if he is probably the most starter-ready, day-one-ready type QB in this class. When it comes down to it, the Jared Goff contract is absolutely horrific, and I think the Lions might be looking to get rid of that after the end of 2022 or 2023 when they can dump that for a minimal dead cap. At the end of the day, uh, it's a salary cap league. You've seen some teams work around it, like the Saints, like the Rams, restructures and all that. But would you rather pay Jared Goff 30 plus million a year for the next few years? Or would you rather end up having Kenny Pickett on the number 32 overall pick associated salary cap hit. For me, it's Kenny Pickett. I don't know that he makes it to 32. I think he could end up being a Panther way earlier. And I think that he could end up being someone that teams trade back into the first round for or someone that goes at the very top of the second round. But I think the Lions would be wise to take him at this position if he gets there. Someone that could go for me as early as 6 or as late as 32. I think the biggest changes that you might see revolves around the quarterbacks. I think Kenny Pickett really could go as early as 6. I think Malik Willis could go as early as 2. I think Stingley could go as early as 3. But when you have the variation with these quarterbacks in Pickett at 6, Willis at 2, 
all the way down to 32. There's a lot of variation. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. And hopefully I ended up getting more than, you know, five or six of these dead on. That's the goal. And uh, hopefully I matched up maybe 10 of these guys to their correct teams. Going to be a higher chance than usual based on how many teams have multiple first round selections. But we shall see. I'll see you for draft coverage tonight on this YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash Bengal. See you in the next one. Take it easy. Joke. I'm laughing so loud. Speed burst good.